Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and it's time for some more daily Ixalan spoilers. So we don't have any new cards since yesterday, it's the calm before the storm with previews officially kicking off tomorrow at PAX, which means we're going to spend today working our way through the big backlog from the spoiler dump on Monday, talking about the black cards along with colorless, multicolor, and land so let's jump right into it we got a million cards to talk about today first up maybe my favorite black card spoiled so far revel in riches probably one of the first against the odds cards to come out of ixalan five mana enchantment whenever an opponent's creature dies you get a treasure token and if you have 10 or more treasures at the beginning of your upkeep you win the game I love cards that say you win the game. It's some of my favorite things to do in all of Magic, trying to achieve the quest to reach the goal of this alternate win condition. And Revel and Riches seems like a pretty sweet one. So the big question we have right now with a partial spoiler is how many ways do we have to make treasures? And right now, we just don't know. I mean, treasure map is a good one. Three treasures, pretty easy to achieve. Prosperous Pirate makes some treasures. So whether or not we'll be able to just like treasure aggro kind of remains to be seen the good news is as artifact tokens they're actually kind of hard to kill at least in mass our opponent sure can abrade our treasures to try to keep the numbers down that way but if our opponents are braiding our treasure tokens we're probably in fine shape anyway like that doesn't sound like a really scary thing or a way for our opponent to win the game so we'll have to see how much support we get for treasures if there's enough good treasure producers we can just play turbo treasures just play everything that makes treasures plan on sticking revel and riches to win the game on our upkeep we can also get some fringe ones by playing fatal pushes and other removal spells to deal with our opponent stuff to get some more treasures on the battlefield so i'm really excited to try the treasure plan and of course we still have mechanized production sitting around so in theory if we play both Revel and Riches and Mechanized Production, we only got to get to eight treasures to win the game if we have a Mech Pro on one of the treasures. Plus, Mech Pro is going to make us more treasures, so I'm super excited to play Mech Pro and Revel and Riches together in the same deck. It just seems like a blast, and this isn't even to mention Commander, where in Commander, you can potentially win right away. Like, with four players, it only takes, like, three and a half creatures per opponent for you to be able to get ten treasures all in one shot with a Damnation, a Bantu's Last Reckoning, some sort of Wrath Effect. So this card is actually super scary in Commander, not just because of the alternate win condition, which is awesome, but just the ability to kill your opponent's stuff and get all this free mana is a really, really powerful effect. Very strong in Commander. So I'm super excited for Revel and Ridges. I think it's going to be a fun against the odds or maybe budget deck in Standard and just a great Commander card. Awesome ramp in a black deck, maybe even a win condition, so just a really flavorful and fun card all around. Next on our list, we have Ruin Raider, which is pretty bonkers. I think this card is actually really, really good. One of the best raid cards ever printed in Magic's history. Three mana, three, two. All right, whatever. But it has raid, so at the beginning of your end step, if you attacked with any creature, you get to get a free card. You reveal the top card of your library, lose life, equal to the card's converted mana cost. So in some sense, this is the next in a long line of bad bobs, bad Dark Confidants. Dark Confidants kind of the original of this ability. We've had Pain Seers, we've had Asylum Visitors, there's so many similar effects, but I think Ruin Raider is actually a good one. I think this might be the best of the bunch. While it's a bit more expensive than some of the other ones, the ability to trigger right away is actually pretty excellent. When you look at Dark Confident, look at Pain Seer, all those cards, you're waiting to your upkeep. With Ruin Raider, all you gotta do is attack with a random 2-drop, play your Ruin Raider, you get a card right away. Even if your opponent kills it during their turn or something, you already got that value, which makes it potentially super powerful. Powerful. As far as what you do with this, I mean, it is a pirate, so of course, this is definitely going to be a part of the pirate deck. There's almost no doubt about it. It's just too good not to. You even have good menace two drops like Fathom Fleet Captain, which makes it easy to attack and get through your opponent's blockers and start drawing cards and just spiral out of control. Admiral Beckett Brass makes it even better, pumps it up a little bit, so definitely a part of the pirate deck, but I don't think you have to be a pirate deck. I think you could be a winding constrictor deck. 
deck. If you think about it, Green Black Constrictor losing Tireless Tracker, one of the only cards that it loses, you could definitely play this as your three drop card advantage engine. You could play a mono black aggro deck. Zombies is in a weird place with all the rotating cards, but Dread Wanderer is still a great recursive one drop. You can attack with it. Sure, maybe your opponent blocks and kills it, but you get it back anyway. Trigger your Ruin Raider. So I think Ruin Raider is one of the most powerful and pushed cards that we have so far from Ixalan spoilers, just as far as how tier one ready it is for standard. I think this one's really, really good, and I expect us to see a lot of play, definitely in Pirates and probably in other places as well. Next up, we have Blood Craze Paladin, which is a really unique card. Two mana, you only get a 1-1, one, one, but it gets big for every creature that died this turn. So if three creatures died, it's a 4-4. Four, four. And it has Flash, which is actually a pretty meaningful upside with an effect like this. So what do you do with Blood Craze Paladin? Well, there's kind of two options. One thing you can do is be a self-sacrifice deck. You're playing hidden stockpiles. You're sacring a bunch of servos, kind of going wide that way, or you could be a deck that's looking to wrath the board. Yohani's expertise, play your Blood Craze Paladin after sweeping the board, it's going to be like a 10-10 or something massive, so you can kind of build around it aggressively, where you're trying to kill your own stuff to make your Blood Craze Paladin good. Of course, there's a bit of risk, it does die to Fatal Push, but really, for the mana cost, if you can make this a 4-4, a 5-5, it is an incredible, incredible deal, so I'm excited about that aspect of it. The other thing you can do is use Blood Craze Paladin as a protection card. If you're playing, let's say, mono black aggro, one of the things that might beat you is a Wrath. Your opponent plays a Fumigate. Your opponent plays a Bantu Last Reckoning. If you can leave up two mana, sure, your opponent wraths away your board. Maybe they kill five or six creatures, but then you just flash in a Blood Craze Paladin and you get back most of that power and toughness and can keep beating down, keep pressuring your opponent. So it's a great way for an aggro deck to kind of protect against a Wrath from the opponent as well. And this is not even to mention the Vampire Synergy. So we know Vampires is a supported tribe. We don't know exactly how much support it'll have. It's one of the main tribes, so I figure a lot. So it could also just be part of a Vampire deck. Oddly, Vampires is the tribe we've probably gotten the least amount of cards for compared to Pirates and Dinosaurs. So we'll have to see where it ends up. But I expect that Blood Craze Paladin has a shot in Standard because the combination of Flash and getting big is really powerful. Next up, we have Dead Eye Tracker, another pirate, and this one's a little bit weird. I'm not sure what to make of this one. One mana, it's only a 1-1, one, one, which is probably the biggest drawback of Dead Eye Tracker, but it has a fairly relevant ability. You get to pay two, tap it to exile two cards from an opponent's graveyard, and you get to explore, which is actually really powerful. I really love the explore mechanic. So you either draw a card, which is great, or you mill a card you don't want, and you make your Deadeye Tracker a little bit bigger. So even though it starts as a 1-1, one, one, it can slowly grow into something more powerful. The big question here is how good is the ability? As a 1-mana one 1-1 one, one that's fairly slow, I'm not sure you can just play this as your 1-drop. If I'm playing Pirate Aggro, I really want my 1-drop to have 2 power and start off with 2 power, although Deadeye Tracker gives a lot of value over the long game. But if God Pharaoh's Gift or Embalm cards are an important part of the format, Deadeye Tracker gets way, way better because it's main deckable graveyard hate to deal with your opponent's God Pharaoh Gift targets, to deal with their reanimation targets, to deal with their embalmed creatures, and it gets much, much better. So even though I'm not 100% sure about how pirates will shake out, I think there's a decent chance that Dead Eye Tracker ends up being playable. So the question is basically, what's the competition? If we're playing aggro pirates, and pirates seem to have enough cards to be an aggro deck, what one drops do we have? Is there better one drops, or two better one drops than Dead Eye Tracker in the format? Then it might kind of sit in the sideboard, sit on the sidelines, unless we have graveyard stuff to hate but if this is just the best option we're going to play it almost by default it does give it a lot of value over the long game thanks to the explorability and it fills out an important part on the curve for an aggro deck so we'll just have to wait and see as we see the rest of the set Next, we have Fathom Fleet Captain, which is a card that I'm pretty confident we'll see playing Pirates. For 2 mana, you get a 2-1 with Menace, which is already nice. You get to start getting in damage. 2-1 Menace for 2 is already basically on curve. And the ability to kind of go to town with Menace Token Pirates whenever you attack, yes, it costs 2 mana, but this can give you a lot of value over the long game. So I think this reminds me of two cards. First off, it reminds me of a Carry Zev Skyship Raider. Definitely different. So the downside of 
fathom fleet captain is it's not as straightforward aggressive carries have hits for three but the tokens from carries have go away at end of turn fathom fleet on the other hand only hits for two but you keep making these menace pirates so if you can get in multiple attacks it's a great mana sink in the late game a great way to just keep building out your board forcing through damage growing your pirate board and the fact that the pirates themselves have menace is a nice benefit as well the other card it kind of reminds me of is mardu strike leader which gives you a free token when it attacks but it's only a two one it doesn't have menace but it's somewhere in this range i think it's definitely a great fit for a pirate deck although if you're not playing pirates gonna have a hard time making it work because you need that first pirate on the battlefield to get the ability rolling but in a pirate deck very solid two drop Finally, we have Varaska's Contempt, the new removal spell, and this is a good one. This falls somewhere between Hero's Downfall and Utter End, so it's not quite as good as Hero's Downfall, I don't think. One additional mana is not made up for by gaining two life, although gaining two life is definitely relevant. It's kind of like a mono-colored utter end. I think it's very comparable to that, so I expect that Vraska's Contempt will definitely see a lot of standard play. Whether it's a four of will depend on how fast the format is. The two life does help it a little bit in aggro matchups, but even with the two life gain, against a deck like Mono Red, Ramanomp Red, four mana is just a lot to kill something, but if the format's kind of mid-range, it gets rid of anything, it gets rid of Planeswalkers, it gets rid of Gideons, and all these annoying, hard-to-deal-with threats because of Exile, so very strong card. We'll just have to see how the format looks before we know the exact number breakdown, but this is one of the cards we've wanted back in Standard. Instant Speed, Planeswalker removal in black is something we've been missing since Hero's Downfall. You've had to have white for that effect, so I think this will be a very, very strong card for black decks and deals with a ton of different problems. Moving on from the black cards to the colorless, multicolor, and lands, we're going to start with one of my favorite cards from the entire set. Sorcerer's Spyglass. It's a two-mana Pithy Needle. It's exactly a two-mana Pithy Needle, and I'm super happy to have this card. Is this card good in our current standard? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. There's nothing right now that I think, oh man, we really need to Pithy Needle this. But the fact that Wizards gave us a Pithy Needle again is super huge. This is one of those safety net cards. It just sits in the format, and then when something gets too messed up, it comes in and saves the day, and this does a great job of it. So one of the things people have been asking is, do you play this over Pithy Needle in older formats? I think the answer is generally no. For the most part, older formats value mana efficiency. So they're going to go with Pithy Needle. And if you're bringing in Pithy Needle, you already know what you're naming. Like, you bring it in to answer a specific combo, a specific card. You don't just bring it in for value. So the peeking at your opponent's hand, while there's value in getting that information, I don't think it's enough value that you're going to pay an extra mana for it. Although, it's a good point. It does get around stuff like Chalice of the Void, if that's a thing. It gets around Mental Misstep and Vintage. So if there's some reason you actively want to be playing 2 mana for your Pithy Needle, then I can see the argument. But for the most part, I think in older formats, you still stick with Pithy Needle. But in Standard, I mean, if you look back over the last year of problems in just horribleness in Standard, Sorcerer's Spyglass, if it was sitting in the format, there's a good chance we would have gotten maybe zero bannings, maybe one banning, maybe two bannings instead of four or five, like just instead of the million bannings that we got, it would have really changed the format. It shuts down the infinite Sahilari Felidare Guardian combo. It stops Smuggler's Copter. It stops Aetherworks Marvel, all for two mana with one card, no matter what broken thing the opponent's doing. Sorcerer's Spyglass is the answer. So the fact that we have this in standard makes me feel very comfortable about things not getting too messed up moving forward. Next time we have some crazy broken thing, Sorcerer's Spyglass is going to save the day. Right now, the targets are kind of middling. Like, it stops Walking Blista, it stops Planeswalkers like Chandra, Aetherflux Reservoir, so I don't see anything that jumps off the page like, oh my goodness, we need Sorcerer's Spyglass, but sooner or later, something will come along, and we should just always have this effect in standard to make sure nothing gets too out of control. Next on our list, we have Vanquisher's Banner, which is one of the sweetest tribal cards we've had in a while. Five mana artifact. You choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type get plus one plus one and when you cast a creature spell of the type you get to draw a card. So this is basically a wombo combo of shared triumph and like kindred discovery. Pumping the creatures and drawing you cards makes it just an 
awesome tribal card. I expect this is all-time commander staple. Any tribal deck in commander will play it, and tribal decks in standard will play it as well. It's not legendary, so it stacks up really impressively. So if you're playing cats, if you're playing pirates, if you're playing midnight entourage, it's a little expensive, so keep that in mind. If you're super aggro, it's probably not good, but there is a ton of value to be had from Vanquisher's Banner in basically any tribal deck in standard, in commander, you name it, this card is going to be super popular. Watch out for foils. They're going to be all over the place for commander. It's This is a great, great, great tribal card, and I expect it to be super popular. Next up, we have Hostage Taker, which is... Kind of one of the most controversial cards in all of Ixalan. So four mana, you get a two, three, and whatever. When it enters the battlefield, you exile an artifact or a creature until it leaves the battlefield, and you can cast that card as long as it remains exiled, spend mana of any cost. So the way this is worded, if you read that card, it goes infinite by itself. So if you play this on an empty board, the game would draw. It just keeps exiling itself, putting it back, exiling, putting it back. And if you played it with like a Perforos or an Impact Tremors on the board, you just kill your opponent with the infinite enter the battlefield triggers. So obviously this was a mistake. They did not want this to be able to exile itself. So Wizards did something that only happens very rarely. They came out and errated the card before it's even been officially released. So what Hostage Taker actually says is when it enters the battlefield, exile another target artifact or creature. So it can't target itself. You don't have any of these infinite loops. Pretty clear that Wizards just accidentally left out a word on Hostage Taker and it was intended to be this way the entire time. There's no way they would intentionally print Hostage Taker to go infinite by itself. What we do have now is is basically this weird combo of Fiend Hunter and Ganti. So we get the Fiend Hunter ability to get rid of a creature. We also have the Ganti ability of being able to cast that. And I think altogether, that still makes Hostage Shaker a pretty powerful option. It's a pirate, so you get the synergies there as well. It is a bit expensive. The biggest deal about Hostage Shaker, though, is it says artifact or creature and blue and black are not colors that get ways to answer artifacts so this means it can get rid of a heart of cure and a paradox engine ether flux reservoir so that's pretty sweet for standard even more importantly this is a blue black staple in commander because scraping around trying to find ways to deal with artifacts which are super important to commander in the blue and black colors is basically impossible so the fact that hostage taker gives blue and black decks a way to deal with an artifact i think just makes it almost an auto include creature types aside anything else aside if you're just playing a fun commander deck that's in blue and black and you don't have white or red to deal with artifacts or green this is going to be a great card to have because it gets rid of that problematic artifact not only that but you get to steal it as well so if you have the mana you can steal your opponent his best artifact and play it on your side it's formatted so you can cast it no matter what color it is if it's not an artifact so all around i think it's a great commander card a fun standard card just be aware of the errata because that will come up sooner or later as you're playing someone's going to play it wrong so just make sure to pull up gatherer pull up the oracle text so people understand the right way to play this card and that the text has been changed finally we got the land cycle the return of the buddy lands and this is a really nice solid land cycle for standard so enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a basic land of their colors basically so for glacial fortress you know plains or an island round catacombs an island or a swamp so these lands are mostly interesting because of where it puts the land mix in standard right now so Ally colors have two full cycles of lands. We have the Amiket cycling lands. We also have the Ixalan buddy lands. And these lands actually work pretty well together. Yes, the cycling lands do enter tap, but they are lands of the right type. They are swamp mountains and island swamps and etc, etc, which means if we have a cycling land on the battlefield, it's going to make our buddy lands come into play untapped really regularly. So ally color decks have really solid mana. Right now, enemy color decks are a bit lacking, actually, in good mana. They have the fast lands, which are great, the single best land cycle in standard right now, but they don't have a good secondary land cycle. So we'll see what this color mix actually means for standard, but the they're cheap, they're very easy, they're good for budget builders because they've been reprinted a million times. So all around, while the Buddy Lands are not an exciting land reprint, it's not like Filter Lands or Fetch Lands or Shock Lands, it's a really solid playable cycle for Standard, great for budget deck builders, going to help keep the price of decks in Standard down. So all around, can't really complain. 
Anyway, that's all for today, so let me know what you think about the new cards, the colorless cards, how good is the lad cycle, pithy needles back, what about the errata of hostage taker? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.